to initially welcome you all into our free webinar from the High Level Training Institute with our expert trainer, uh, Ioannis Papa Constantino. Some of you might know him. And uh, the topic for today is the HRM in the age of the big reset, a call for leadership. Uh, Johannes Papa Constantino is a highly experienced uh, expert trainer and also has been teaching in the executive MBAs besides uh, holding a lot of uh, positions in the expo centers for restructuring and managing directors and many, many other positions besides consulting, coaching and mentoring. Uh, without any further ado, uh, Johannes, I would like to leave the discussion so you can take it over and right. uh, we can proceed accordingly with the, with, the, with the topic. Okay, instead of saying the floor is mine, we'll say the screen is mine. You know, that's, uh, that's the new normal now. So good evening, everybody. I'm very happy to be with you today to share some thoughts about what HRM does and what HRM should do in the face of this big reset we are facing because it's definitely a big reset. It's um, like you, you, know, you turn off the, your modem or your computer and then when it restarts, it shows you something totally different. And uh, we are going through an era that uh, we have never met, probably our great grandparents or our parents, for those of us who are a little bit older, have uh, experienced the Second World War or other important cases. But this is something which is definitely without any uh, precedent. And uh, now it's the time that HR has to play a crucial role in order to be able to deliver successfully what it owed to. And uh, generally we are facing a situation where you know, people are losing lots of stuff. First of all, uh, people are in great distress. People are sick. Uh, our relatives might be sick, hopefully not, and I hope you're all safe. Uh, some people may lose their relatives in the months or they have already done this. Some people are losing their work. Some people are experiencing pay cuts or they lose their bonuses or they lose their contacts they have in their everyday life because work used to be part of our everyday life. So these are some of the repercussions. We can list hundreds for all of us that have been through this uh, confinement and uh, lockdown and we are experiencing this, this uh, pandemic. So let me start by analyzing a little bit what this big reset means, because uh, there are lots of, it's a polyparametric uh, issue. The first one is work, all right? The, the nature of work is changing. It's funny that we've been discussing in the past in different courses in the university about the nature of work and how to make it more interesting and job crafting and different other stuff and suddenly, uh, within three months, the whole world of work has changed dramatically. So one part, of course, that we possibly all experience is the work from home, which is something that for some of us might have been a routine in the past or now, um, and we may cope with that. But there are other people that cannot really cope by staying at home and working. Okay, it might sound very alluring at the beginning, you know, being with your pajamas or with your t-shirt and doing work from home. Uh, and this is okay, but uh, when it goes for a long time, it becomes quite distressful for, for people. So working from home is one part. And of course, there is the other part, people that couldn't work from home. And we have the, the new situation now where, okay, Many companies have already decided to keep their people working from home in the case they can. Amazon, Amazon Yahoo again reinvented, re, re, reissued this, um, th this work from home and other organizations, especially the ones in, in the information technology or consulting or whatever else. I've been doing consulting through Zoom or Skype the last three months, uh, trying to avoid being exposed. Now I'm, I'm exposed because the lockdown in Greece has gradually started to, to lift. Um, but we have also the other issue, the people that are already working and couldn't go away because, for example, in a production factory, 
book, which is not that automated and you needed some manual work or some work from people who had, had to be present. And this is another issue that is, has to be taken into consideration. And furthermore, now we are bringing people back. So what has happened actually is that we have, let's say, entered much more violently the digital transformation journey probably we didn't expect that in last january in january i was in uh, in ukraine in an american company which was very is actually doing digital transformation this is what they do and uh, we were discussing the different projects they had and when i were i was asking them about when do you see that this will happen they were giving me time frames of eight months ten months a year a year and a half two years for the different projects they are running for very big companies worldwide. I discussed with the CEO, their CEO, a week ago, and I said, how's it going? He said, it's, it's being frantic. Everyone is asking for the digital transformation. And now we are transforming digitally the whole society. All right, so this is one thing that uh, was, let's say, a repercussion of working from, from home. Uh, also, the other dimension is that companies have tested their agility. You know, we used to say that an agile organization is the one that uh, fixes the plane as it flies. Actually, the new agility regime is uh, building the airplane while it flies, which is absolutely uh, different. So also work became more agile and it has to be even more agile and being able to adapt fast in the new circumstances because what is going to unfold with people coming back to work and having to be social distanced within the work all right instead of sitting next to somebody you will the person will be sitting two meters away from you or a meter and a half whatever is gonna is gonna be and we found out that this shift has happened within you know days not months that were they were espoused and uh, this actually let's say increased organizational agility in many cases. And this is one of the benefits of, of this pandemic, which might cause negative aspects, but also there are some positive ones that we shouldn't neglect for sure. Um, so one issue that it has to be very, let's say well in our mind, is that we shouldn't assume that we're gonna get back to the old ways of working. You know, the habit of, you know, going every day to the office and do the work and blah, blah, blah for all of us was there, but this habit has to change. So if you don't stop making this assumption, you will not be able, first of all, to cope with the tremendous dramatic changes that are happening. Uh, so HR, what has to do first is to try to see how it will organize work for what we, we will call the distributed workforce. Workforce is going to be still distributed in many cases. Accounting, HR why it might possibly be distributed. Okay, other functions of the organization, sales, we'll see. Companies are adapting now to something new that we don't really know. And of course, uh, what's really important is to accelerate the best practices possible around collaboration, flexibility, inclusion, and accountability. Let me explain a little bit on that. When we are at home, when we are distanced from our office, that means that we lose our relations and connections and stuff like that. So people gradually start to feel a little bit out of the game. So if you don't instill collaboration, strong collaboration with different tools we will discuss later on, uh, flexibility by giving authority at lower levels in order for people to make decisions. If you don't have clear policies now for inclusion, people that are introverts or people who, who feel that if they're not there, they don't really participate, might feel more and more disengaged. And all this has to be, let's say, packaged or wrapped with accountability. Because when you give flexibility, you give, you give autonomy to lower level, uh, you, it has to be also at the level of the accountability that is having the authority to make a decision and being able to explain it as we're going to see. Furthermore, since we are talking about a new networked organization but in a dispersed 
let's say, area, we should stop thinking of the classical organizational structures, you know, the boxes, the lines, the circles, whatever this was and how it was, it was pictured. This changes. Let me make a parenthesis here. If one, one of the biggest nightmares of any HR person in the world is when the organization decides to restructure. And this is going to happen. We're going to restructure our companies in different ways. Restructuring means from the very simple changing the job description, changing the objectives and key results or KPIs, name them as you want in your organization, changing the performance management system because you need to think, how am I going to evaluate those people? Changing the training that these, these people need in their new, let's say, um, duties they have to perform by being dispersed and so many other things that is happening even recruitment will change and i'm talking about recruitment is a some of you who have dealt in the past with recruitment might possibly have realized that um, a, 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 through a screen you might have a totally different opinion for a person that afterwards you meet in person so things are really going to, to change. The second dimension we need to have in mind also is that you know, lines and authority were fixed in many organizations with some parts of flexibility. Now we have to think horizontally. We need to think straight about the fast pace of decision making and execution. Without this, we will not be able to cope again with what we are going to face in uh, with these fast changes and this of course leads again to the notion of agility the flexibility and the speed to adapt in the changing circumstances a more strategic issue concerning work is and it's still a question for all of us is whether we are going to experience the contact free economy a month ago, I was reading um, uh, an article about the Four Seasons Hotel in New York that was hosting doctors, medical doctors, in order for them to be close to their uh, clinics and not going back home because, you know, the distances in, in, in New York are quite big. So, and they have actually uh, implemented some hygiene protocols. And, you know, when we're talking about, for example, hospitality, the interaction between the customer and the host I and mean, the, the, the personnel the employee of of the hotel for example is critical to the success i mean the smile the, the service the, the 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 imagine now going to a hotel and you have to check in on your own there is an envelope on the desk and you just you know and, and also the, the the credit card reader so the envelope is there you pass over the credit card it was you are charged you get your envelope with your uh, lock key uh, card for your room. There you go. Room service, sorry. Mini bar, sorry. More. So all this, and this is not only in the in the hospitality. This is the same in the conferences, in the events, in the exhibitions. This is what I was discussing earlier on with Dr. Rimeri. That, I mean, I've been in the exhibitions industry for quite some time in in the past. Germany has postponed the majority of their exhibitions when they open up what is going to happen how many people are going to be in the stands how many visitors lower visitors means possibly that you don't have so many participants so that means less revenue so really at the end of the day are the exhibitions viable so all these create major questions about strategic choices organizations have to make strategic choices have tremendous repercussions on hr we are the ones that we'll, we'll have and we should support the strategy of the organization to succeed, the new one. Still, companies are not clear about their strategies. They are, let's say, uh, going one step forward, two steps back, and two steps forward, one step back, trying to see what they're going to do, how they're going to, to survive in the new uh, era where we are going to enter very, very soon. Now. The second reset is the budget. And when I'm talking about the budget, the obvious is about the HR budget that will change for sure by reallocating the resources we have available for new training, developing of competencies, 
all these that, that uh, happen, but also there are other dimensions. And when I talk about the budget, I'm talking about also the bureaucracy. You know, we have this as HR people, we can become supremely bureaucratic, all right? We should forget this. I don't know if you are in working, those of you in a, in a, in a global organization, I, I know that some of you might do, uh, do, not might do. So imagine that, you know, every HR process is centralized that comes from a central hub. This will never work anymore. HR processes should go down to the first and second level of HR people in order to eliminate bureaucracy and move fast. So, because bureaucracy at the end of the day, you know, kills employee experience. And employee experience, as we all know, is the journey an employee goes through a company. Now, this is part of the journey. Social distancing, working from home, losing of conduct, whatever this is, this is a part of the journey. If we are not there to support this, it will be a disaster. People will become more and more disengaged. And of course, this will not help anyone. And talking about bureaucracy, I'm also talking about decision making. This is a saying from one top CEO worldwide that said that uh, our senior team meets every morning for 30 minutes. It's incredibly productive. We make decisions and we go. We don't have full information, but that's okay. We can't afford not to move. We will make decisions with limited information. We will make mistakes, but definitely we need to do it. Otherwise, we're going to be overwhelmed by the wave that it's coming. All right. So that's the, the other part of the reset. The third part of the reset, of course, is leadership. You know, leadership is the, the buzzword worldwide. We all talk about leadership, what it is, what it should be. And concerning leadership in hard times, there are a few things that we need to have in mind. Most of all, the key, let's say, point is empathy and compassion. Let me clarify this a little bit. Empathy meaning and means understanding the feelings of others. Uh, compassion's mean, compassion means willing and actually helping people that have issues. But this is not only towards our employees, which is part, but it's also towards our customers, our suppliers, other stakeholders. What do our companies do in order to support the society? the environment, the government, the, the ESG, as we, as we call it. What do we do? And furthermore, we should, apart from our employees, that it's absolutely normal to show empathy and compassion, normal, supposedly, but it ha we have to. Also, our customers need to be the receivers of our empathy and compassion, because they have gone through lots of stuff themselves too. If we don't demonstrate this, then, and leadership doesn't pass this over, and HR doesn't support this by specific practices to do that, then it will never really work. This is the, the revenge of uh, holacracy, as I call it. Holacracy is a concept of, you know, organizations that don't have clear organizational structures and don't have clear bosses. Everyone can be a boss. It's a, all right, I'm not going to develop more on this, but one other repercussion we have about leadership, and it's a big reset, is that we're talking about the bossless organization. Why? Because when you delegate authority, autonomy, accountability at the lower levels in order to be able to respond locally at the different and fast, then the boss and his or her, let's say, authority become a little bit obsolete. So this is another thing we need to, to have in mind as HR. Can we apply a bossless organization? Yes. Are we sure? Do we have the skills, the abilities, the people? Or should we develop people in order to be able to take authority, to take responsibility, to make decisions? There are big, big, big repercussions on, on this issue as well. Finally, concerning this part of leadership is what I call purpose. Purpose is the answer to why are we here? Why are we doing what we do? And um, first of all, keep in mind that there are some organizations that have traded their long-term sustainability 
for short-term outcomes, you know, to, to survive. All right, this is legitimate in one sense, and I wouldn't really, let's say, blame anybody, but uh, when you have a crisis such, a, such as COVID-19, it's your strong culture that I'm going to discuss later on, and your sense of purpose that actually all leaders should model every day and this can help you weather the storm better than most of your competitors or others. And purpose means what am I doing for the betterment of my customers, of society, of the environment, and does this have a meaning? If the company has a purpose, then people could possibly, our individuals could possibly identify with this. It's not easy. And we have been discussing purpose the last, let's say, seven to eight years. Still, many organizations stay with their vision or mission statement, which is a corporate dimension, but doesn't have any clear, let's say, external dimension in, in, its, uh, in its saying. The fourth big reset is trust. You know, trust gradually has eroded the last decades. This is from different surveys worldwide. And in this time of uncertainty, our people, our customers, should trust our organization. And from our point of view, we should develop more trust to these people. So how this works, which is very important. Trust is a very human and emotional and multidimensional uh, uh, notion. It has four aspects. The first one is the physical, okay? Tr you should have trust that your physical space is safe. Work, home, whatever it is. The second dimension, probably the most important for some people, but it's one of the four, it's the financial one. Trust that your financial concerns are being served. This is also something that we're going to face and we'll see whether it will work or not. The third one is the emotional part. Trust that your emotional and societal needs are being safeguarded. No loss of contact of relationships. It's very, very critical. And the fourth dimension of trust is the digital one, which is very, very delicate. All right, in Europe, we have the GDPR, you know, the, this policy about protection of personal data, of people and stuff like that. But suddenly going digital in many dimensions also causes a question to people whether their data are safe and are not, are not being misused. And this is a delicate question as we're gonna see, a delicate issue, because if HR doesn't have some delicate data, sometimes cannot really serve people. Cornerstone to all this is that whatever we do has to be based on ethics. That's a Greek word for those of you who, who don't know. Ethics means, you know, serving up greater values, means also telling the truth. In bad times, a boss, whatever boss, from HR, the, the, the CEO, the COO, whoever, if you don't tell the truth, people will understand. If you don't tell the truth, people will not be prepared for what's going to come. For example, there are many companies today who are thinking of doing rotational work or half work. I mean, instead of getting, you know, working a full month or full time, you become a part time. Part time means part time payment. Part time payment means you cannot really support your family sometimes okay in some cases so if this happens you have to be honest and tell people the truth don't bring it as a surprise you know uh, i need to tell you today that i've seen the budget and the company will not survive if we not do this and from tomorrow this what is going to happen this doesn't work because it's very surprising you have to prepare telling people the truth that i'm going to do this and see what's going on people are aware, better prepared and accept the negative impact of this kind of severe, hard decisions, much, much uh, easier. 
another dimension is you have to give everybody a voice. Employees have to speak up their fears, their grief, their anxiety, customers too, your value chain in general too. This is the time of listening. And supposedly HR plays such a role in this period we are entering, because now we are entering a now a new period, we should even listen more. And when I say listen, I mean really listen, right? Not just, you know, okay, I heard you and this is it. We have to, to show empathy, as I said earlier, compassion, if possible, help our people really listen to their concerns, griefs, whatever they have to tell us. Because they need to speak. They are afraid of what is possibly coming. Furthermore, trust, trust is increased by transparency in decision making. You might say that this is something that it's given. Well, not all the time. And transparency doesn't mean the end result. Transparency means the process. It's what we call the procedural justice. You have made a decision. Is the process through which we made the decision a transparent one? A well-argued one? If it is, people will accept it much easier. So if, for example, you are forced as HR to downsize slightly, to eliminate jobs, to whatever you do, who goes has to be through a transparent decision by giving specific arguments why. Otherwise, it will destroy the morale even more. Imagine morale is now definitely low. I mean, no one can really doubt that. Imagine going through a non-transparent decision-making process about some hard decision you have to make and people even the survivors, as we call them, will be even more demoralized, right? Another issue about trust, and this now goes to what, how our company gives trust to the outer world, to the customers. You know, it's, it's a classic discussion we have about competencies and competence models and all, all this stuff. You know, it's time now to rethink the competencies our people should have in order to serve the customer the, with a new way. Most, some of us, not most, some of us, or some of the people in the organization we're working, are going to work behind the plexiglass. Some of us were going to work with a distance from other people of two or more meters. Some of us need to follow specific rules and procedures. This has to be done with the best possible way. Why? Because if you misdeliver, your customers will not trust you anymore. I was saying earlier, I had a misdelivery from one of the biggest electronic uh, sites worldwide. A few days ago, I ordered the book, never arrived. I ordered it before the lockdown, never arrived. It was coming from the States. Um, and I was very, very skeptical on what to do. So my last resource was to contact them and try one more time. Well, not well, try to see what's going on. You know what happened? I contacted them on Thursday. The book came today from the States. Why? Because this company when they found out that they were misdelivering, they were losing customers, and they have reorganized and restructured everything they do. They changed their supplier concerning the international shipments. They have changed possibly the people that were serving at their call center or chat center, whatever they, they have. I mean, they have the chat center, right? So these people restored or they kept the, high, the quality high. So for me as a customer, not to have a second thought of whether I'm staying with this supplier or not, or changing to another supply, supplier of electronic buying. And the fifth reset is the reset in HRM, in human resource management, people management, call it whatever you want. Uh, and 
what is this reset? First of all, we will become the superheroes. We have to be the superheroes. Why? Because as I said earlier, we need to support everything the organization does concerning the strategic changes that it will go through. Since the whole business model might be changing on how we deliver value to our customers, how we sell, how we create growth for our organization, this has, as I said earlier, tremendous repercussions for us. So it has repercussions for job evaluation. If you use, for example, Hayes model, as I said, performance, training, rewards, it's going to be a total new work. Furthermore, it's our job. HR is always doing these nasty things on talking about communicating about the crisis, communicating with the, with the employees, devising the new policies, health and safety, for example, as you can see at the lower level, new programs, being responsible for the cleanliness of the whole organization or the different premises. This comes to us apart from the strategic dimension that I said earlier, to support the whole transform transformation of the business model itself. And this requires from us to move fast, very fast, in order to catch up with all the developments we are going to face. And for us as well, to be accountable. That is, have the complete responsibility for what we do and being able to give a satisfactory reason why we do this. This might sound to you a little bit awkward, all right? Uh, in a, a period where unemployment rises very high, the states, it's, go, it's above 30 million now, it's a, something which is really crazy. I say that you have to treat your, the talents you have as your scarcest resource. But think it in a different way. If you want to transform your organization, transform your value proposition, transform the way you grow, the business model, who is going to serve this? Your people. Actually, their passion, their skills, their capabilities, their judgment and creativity. What they bring to work. If you're going to change the business model, you need creative people to support it and have also new thoughts about this. Because with people, you can definitely rebuild. One more thing which might be a little bit peculiar is that, and this refers to remote working, is that, you know, in the past I had a proposal to move to the Middle East for a, a position. I rejected it because I had some obligations here and I couldn't really leave at that time. Question is, should HR or will HR need to attract now global talent that can deliver their services through this digital transformation that we are going through the very fast digital transformation? So could I deliver this service to the Middle East, to this country I had the proposal from through my laptop? It's a question that we will most possibly face since we will become more and more digitized. Yes, this is going to happen. We, can, we will be able to look for employees, suppliers, whatever this is going to be, through the different collaboration platforms that are now flourishing and thriving. Discussing about working from home, uh, we must keep in mind that we need to have some good practices in place. And the, the critical thing for HR is to have the tools, All right? Okay, Zoom, Slack, Trello, Outlook, whatever it is, are there. Okay, we use them all. I'm using it. We are using it actually right now. The question is, do we have working from home policies? And when I'm talking about working from home policies, the questions come here again. How do you run your pulse surveys about employee engagement? How do you run learning? I mean, in the classic office environment, 
people learn from much more interaction with others with let's say informal advice whatever it is. when people are at home or in a in distant location for example you might need to break up offices that yesterday were with 100 people you need possibly to create four offices with 25 people in different locations with the same town with people that will never meet all right how do you set goals which are the goals now under the digital and the remote work era how do you do performance management how do you rate your people on what basis usually you you have a check-in or whatever else can you always do check-ins via via digital what are they doing are they working at home that that's that's some big issues that are arising and we need to have them in mind on how we will uh, let's say deal with these changes so a key for us that will make the difference is to create a small bunch of really practical tools that hr people can use in order to avoid getting being confused and also our internal customers should could use the managers the supervisors the employees otherwise it will never work another dimension is to set rules and there are some the four rules actually that apply first of all suppose you have people working from home who pays for their laptop who pays for their internet connection who pays for these expenses second how they are being paid those people by time by output will it stay the same i don't know it's things that we are going to we need to to see probably you will change the, the, your rewards because you will pay people on project basis instead of you know having a salary it's something which we might face third issue with the rules the security i said earlier because people working from home have access to lots of data entire platforms actually with delicate data but these need to be protected so we must be very careful with that and the first the, th the third the fourth issue sorry is that we need for those people who are working from home and not all of, of us are let's say prominent users of all these new tools you need to have a helpline for your people technological helpline someone has to be there to help them maybe 24 hours a day not the same person you understand what i mean so these are critical rules in order to support our people to do their work another issue that arises are the norms the new norms that are coming with the working from home issue you work from home you work with a t-shirt uh should you have your video camera on are the children going around or is the cat going around or in front of your screen uh do you say jokes do you use emojis and of course uh for me one of the most critical issues is when you are remote from your office and you are an introvert you don't express yourself it's very critical to equip managers with the way that they make white people involved otherwise we will lose their contribution norms refer to culture and uh, the culture we have as, a, as an organization might be innovation focused people focused profit focused whatever whatever could possibly be the values and norms and behaviors we have in the organization but there are other issues concerning culture so actually culture which is a notion that people are laughing at oh, our culture yeah and you know well actually it is invisible when things are going well but when things are going hard it's probably the glue that will keep people together and avoid the organization to enter into inertia confusion and mistrust furthermore uh keep in mind that for people that are staying at home culture is with them at home for those who are coming back or those who will come and go at home they bring the culture with them 
So by having an issue of whether they, we have a goal-oriented culture, innovation, and things, we need to respond to this. And is this culture working under the new situation? Is it a goal-oriented culture now working? If it's a people-centered culture, are we having all the policies, all the managerial, the leadership that's needed to be people-oriented? And all this will require the notion of psychological safety. Psychological safety, for those of you who might not know what it is, is a, a notion that says that people have to accept, first of all, that are vulnerable. Second, that they can expose their vulnerabilities and their deficiencies to their team, to their organization, and no one will bully them, no one will point at them, no one will laugh at them. But these deficiencies and vulnerabilities are going to be accepted. Because keep in mind, in this totally disturbed situation, the slightest, slightest, let's say, sign of misbehavior towards our people can lead them out of the organization or to complete disengagement. Probably you pay them, but they don't deliver what, they, what, what you want. And this is very, very critical. Now, working from home is something that is relentless. And this is a trap that we need as HR to guide our people. When you, use, when you work at your office and then the weekend comes, you have the option of switching off. And probably it's a, how can I say that, a psychological right on weekends I switch off. But working from home can become relentless, doesn't have a beginning and an end. And this is very important. People might get burned out. I'm sure you have come across the most recent surveys that say that, you know, working from home and lots of teleconferencing like what we do right now, actually, are draining people's strengths and are draining their psychology. So this is something that HR, which is, in, let's say, responsible for the health and safety and the well-being of their people, they should be very careful with, with that. Um, so in general, HR has to ensure that it, has, it will give people a sense of empowerment, energy, independence, and health and well-being. So also to give them time and space. So in order to have a predictable experience at home with support and recognition. And when I'm talking about recognition, how does a manager recognize someone remotely? You know, when you're at the office, the eye contact, you understand, even without saying anything. Well, eye contact through the screen, it's a little bit cold, isn't it? So this is something we need to, to, to keep in mind as well. And trying to close all this is that what's very important for our organizations and for ourselves and for everybody who works in organizations is that we will need two dimensions of resilience, organizational and personal. Resilience means being able to bounce up under a difficult situation. And the big question is whether COVID-19 is the new normal or a black swan. I, I don't think anyone has the answer. Okay, I have an idea, I can share it with you, that it's going to be the new normal and not just a black swan, that is a once-off event that will lead us back to what we, we've been doing. Uh, but this will also define what resilience means. So organizational resilience. I said earlier, we will redefine the business model. That, that is a strategy. So this means that we will define also redefine the operating model. What did I say? The structure, the accountabilities, ways of working, capabilities of people, processes, technology, all this stuff need to be rethought again from our organizations and from HR 
because we support with what we do the operating model. The second dimension of organizational resilience is the capability of our people. People will need deep levels of training and experience. People in order to support the new model need that. If we don't do it, they will never be able to support. We will collapse for sure. The third dimension concerns socio-technical systems and personal relationships within the organization. You know, the organizational chart has the lines and the dots and whatever else it has. And this is one part. But all of you, I'm sure, you have some best friends in your organization, some people you trust, some people you discuss with. And you discuss with at the standing coffee corner where for five minutes you share your thoughts about work, family, friends, boyfriends, girlfriends, whatever this, wives, spouses, whatever this is. If you're away from these people, this hurts. So HR should be there with the tools we have discussed earlier, Trello, uh, Zoom, create private groups, people talking. We should be there to help them. The fourth dimension concerns data sharing. This is, as I said, very, very delicate because shared data and real-time awareness is something we need to have in order to support our people. Like, for example, you have an employee who is 63 years old. His children or her children are out of town because they work somewhere else or they live somewhere else. He does, he's not married, doesn't have any relatives, is, a, let's say, in a group of people that could possibly be easily affected by COVID. What do you do as HR to support this person? So you need to have this data in order to be able to support your people. Even to say it in a different way, you might have somebody that is at home with his or wife or her husband should be uh, said in a different way. You know, we found out that how our relationships are with our, let's say, next of, of kin, the person we are married with, uh, during this lockdown. And we found out whether the person we have gone through for myself the last 26 years is really what I thought. Fortunately, she is all right, and I hope the same applies to everybody. But, uh, you know, we are rethinking all this. So, question if you found out that your spouse or your husband is someone that you really don't want to be with and you have fights, this affects your, your, uh, your employee's performance. Question should you have a possibly uh, a psychologist or a coach? that someone can talk to in order to resolve these kind of issues and have some psychological support. This is a nature's job. Leadership, coming back, creates trust, we said. Furthermore, leadership should support failure, creativity, and innovation. And I say failure first, because creativity and innovation come hand in hand with failure sometimes. Not to say most of the times. As leaders, we need to support people on this dimension. Fail. Don't screw the whole organization up. But you can fail. I will support you. For me, it's enough that you have tried and you put an effort to make things better. Because you will need, as I said, creativity and innovation to support your new business model. A final word for the organizational part in, resili in resilience, joy. You might say, joy? Under this stressful moment, yes, joy. Because um, when the, the when this, let's say, situation is like this, we need to think, I don't have a, an answer for that. It's something that struck in my mind. Uh, you need to think how work will become as more joyful as it can. Not happy-go-lucky, not going with the pink glasses in the, in the office, meaning that, you know, people that are feeling 
gradually disengaged, afraid, whatever this is, anxious, if they find joy in what they're doing, not purpose, purpose is another dimension of the personal resilience issue. Uh, I mean, they have connections. They, something is happening that makes them happy. This is critical, really critical. Now, concerning the personal resilience dimension, of course, the first issue is the positive attitude. Some people are born with positive attitude and a sunny face. Some people are not. HR has to be there to pass a message over to everybody that we're going to pass the, through this together. We're going to be there to support. Even if you lay someone off, you have to be there to support them on what they could do to find a new job because you will find out and you see that that new jobs are opening worldwide in different industries with different specializations now. So this is something, for example, in transportation, delivery, stuff, stuff like that. The second thing to, to keep a positive attitude is the way you communicate. If you were enthusiast or let's say solid in your communication yesterday, I mean in February, you have to be even more enthusiast now, more positive. You have to show this. People will love it, will engage even more. So you create this sense of optimism. And again, this is critical to be bounded with psychological safety. The second dimension is what type of mindset people should have. You know, it, this is a discussion that has been run for the last 10 years or even more between a growth and a fixed mindset. Now, in order to thrive in the new era, in the new normal, only a growth mindset can help you. That is to cope with the face of uncertainty, to learn to do what you're asked, to failures, I mean, to understand that failures offer opportunities for growth. But this means that leadership management espouses this not only spouses, their practices are also helping people to do this. If you have a fixed mindset, it will never really work. Relationships. Just to say this in closing about relationships. Work, home, family, community. You know, probably you are aware of what we call the happiness report. It's being produced annually about different nations and how happy their people are. Greeks are one of the lowest countries. We used to be at the top before 2009, uh, but uh, now we are under 10 years of austerity and all this nice stuff. We've been uh, a little bit, you know, at, at the lower level. Now, when you see what factors are playing an important role in happiness, of course, you will have finance, personal finance. One of the strongest correlated factors are relationships. So at the personal level, we must keep our relationships alive. Relationships from work, home, I said earlier, the broader family, community. Because people who don't have this, they suffer high levels of stress. I have my parents, they are 80 plus years old, right? They have been inside their house for the last three months and I see them day by day they are you know their psychology is going down trying to keep them warm you know we Skype a little bit and stuff like that but you know if you don't go out it's it's not really easy to to to, to do that the fourth dimension of personal resilience your organization has a purpose are you aligned with this if you are aligned, this gives meaning and mission of your work and your life. It's important to have a personal purpose. Work and life possible. Why am I here? Do I make the difference in what I do? Do I feel good about what I'm doing? Which is also very important. And just to close the purpose at both levels, organizational and personal, Organizations need to rethink purpose by putting first environment, society, government. What they do to the greatest 
audience, not only to their customers, which is also important. All right. Final part is progress. We need to ensure as HR that people that work from home or remotely or, or in, in our organization, but they lack their contacts, the, the mentors, the, the, the coaches, whatever they possibly lack at that time, they have the ability to perform, achieve, and grow. So it's very important to do things that are fulfilling our personal mission, very uh, correlated uh, with uh, work. Work shouldn't be frustrating. If it is frustrating, doesn't help us grow and show progress. So HR should rethink the work, how it should be now in order to help people grow and progress. Is this going to be the new normal? No one really knows. Okay, the future is unknown. I don't have a, I think no one has a, has a clue. I told you I have an idea, but it's just an idea. I think only, only future will tell, will tell, and the future is definitely unknown. Uh, I hope I, that's all from me at the, for the moment. I hope I didn't take much more of the time I was allocated spent. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Johannes, for this very insightful uh, information and uh, an amazing topic that you have been articulating. Yes, uh, I have asked uh, the participants to stress out uh, questions they might have in the chat, but uh, I'm not hearing anything in terms of questions or uh, having a question from their side. So hopefully... Possibly they can ask me uh, live. I mean, yeah, or maybe they can address live questions if they want. Yeah, for me it's, so, uh, it's okay. Uh, yeah, I just got a new message now from Nuha. Thank you for the good lecture and valuable information. Which Nuha? Nuha Sakir. Yes, she's with us. Hi Nuha. Hope you are well. <laughs> yeah, she greeted as well. So, uh, any other guy, any question you might have you would like to stress out? So, please feel free. Uh, we have from Nikon who is having a question stating what could be the most HRM's headache in the time of new normal and sudden big reset in a developing country. What would, could be the biggest headache for what the HRM be in, in, the new, in the new normal in a developing country? Correct. All right. The, I will need one more hour. <laughs> okay, no. just, just, just kidding. Look. Uh, Everything is, is concerning the interaction between the organization, first of all, and the environment. If the organization is going to adopt a new strategy to interact now with the environment and uh, go back to the levels of growth it possibly had, or through a new business model, if you have a new strategy and a new business model, this means that you have to reconsider all your, all your HR policies and practices you had in place till February and now with a new model that might require new skills, new people, new talents, new competences, new abilities, even new mindsets, even new leadership. Imagine now that you are in front of a you know, white piece of paper, say, Right, I need to devise now the policies on how we are going, the HR policies, on how the people management policies, on how we are going to deliver this. That's the biggest headache. It doesn't play a role if it's a developing or a, a developed country, really. It's how your organization is going to interact. I wish, I wish, and I say this in, in, very honestly, I wish you to have this headache. Because if you don't, you are working in the wrong organization. Or unless you're working in a monopoly. I mean, a monopolistic company. If you don't have this headache, then something is wrong with the organization. Doesn't cope possibly with the new normal. If this is going to be the new normal. Uh, that, sounds, that sounds interesting. I mean, more or less, I guess your, your, your uh, feedback answers Nikon's question. And uh, anyone else, any, any question, I mean, uh, would you like to stress? As uh, we, we, we run a little bit late with the presentation, so 
Uh, is it possible to get a recording of the webinar? Well, I need to discuss that initially with Ioannis for the IP rights. <laughs> free, 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 free of charge, feel free. <laughs> in, uh, in addition to that, I would, uh, I mean, it's not the intention and the purpose of uh, promoting uh, a live virtual training program, but uh, for those that who might be interested, we are having a certified human resource management executive program, online virtual training session with Ioannis. That is from the 1st to 5th of June next month. And uh, it's around 12 hours presentations, uh, two hours and something per day. It followed by an examination and the successful people will be, uh, of course, uh, awarded the Certified Human Resource Management Executive. So we will be referring to all this, expounding even more these critical issues that might be helping you drive your organization for the future for the future of futuristic uh, matters uh, so if you would uh, like to to get any any further information if you are interested to get any insights or just type i mean here the info at uh, what is it sorry It's, in a, it's info this is in american style so how do i change in english okay mm. so info at hlti.org so if you would like to receive uh, the detailed brochure uh, I would be more than happy to do so with the rest of the HLTI team and uh, it's really looking towards raising the bar for the future. Uh, I'm always learning from Janis as well myself. Some people might have attended training with, with me. Uh, you can learn also from uh, Johannes as we go through with the time. So Johannes, thank you very much. I guess uh, we have closed with the questions. My Thesis, thank you for such a great presentation and I'd like to get through this crisis. Thank you, Tissi, I really appreciate that. And uh, we look forward to hear back from you and hopefully in the future we'll have more uh, people so we can help and provide uh, as much as we can insights uh, in this difficult period of uh, time, especially in typical crisis that we are going through. Mm -hmm. So once again, highly appreciate you, Johannes, your effort. Thank you, Spence. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, being with us. Uh, guys, thank you, thank you for participating and uh, we, we will continuously keep you in the loop regarding the upcoming uh, sessions. Right. So, take care and have a good day ahead. Stay positive. Stay positive <laughs> indeed, yeah, that's right. Super. Bye now. Bye for everybody. <laughs>